Reading in my armchair by the window this winter morning, my eye catches peripheral motion, a black-capped chickadee inches away on the cold side of the glass. What I want to write about is not the crook of its legs that bend like bobby pins, the tiny claws defying gravity to clamp the bar of the mutton. No, nor the tufts of feathers as colorless as dust or that impervious nervous pertness in the eye. What I want to put down on paper is not the bird itself, but the space from which it has just flown. This is Jefferson's favorite shrub. The, is that uh, the grandfather's beard or? No, it's called, ghost? no, it's uh, spice bush. Oh, spice bush. Smell it. You, you can get just the. Uh, oh, nice. man. It's just a. That is just really the tail sweet. end of it, but. Yeah, yeah. It's done real well. Come on in. Meet Richard Taylor, father, poet, writer, and visual artist. I first met Richard on the sidelines of a soccer field when our kids played on the same team. And then I came to know his writing when he became Kentucky Poet Laureate. But I had no idea he was a visual artist until he showed me his journals that were full of sketches. Richard kindly invited me into his home. So, you paint, mm -hmm. you draw. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. <laughs> How does, um, it, and before I came here today, I thought you had just taken it up in the past few years, but evidently mm -hmm. you've done that for a long time. Mm -hmm. So what draws you to uh, painting or art, you know, it, uh, visual it, art? It I goes back to my father, who was a lawyer, only by default. He wanted to be a landscape architect, and he discovered early on that he could not draw. And the irony is that on my mother's side of the family, half of them were professional artists. One ran a commercial oh. art studio. I had two cousins who were painters. My uncle, it's a wonderful painting of his in the hall. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I grew up drawing little stick figures and uh, and didn't really revive an interest in it until, gosh, I guess I, I moved to Mississippi when I got out of the law. I practiced law for about three months, and, <laughs> and my gift to the Commonwealth of Kentucky was not practicing it anymore, <laughs> and except for the occasional divorce <laughs> for my friends when I was in uh, graduate school. Anyway, I, my fr the first teaching job I got uh -huh. was in Mississippi. And uh, I, uh, I took a little oils course, and I had lots of time. It was in a pretty remote part of the state, and there was not much to do. Right. So I just painted in the weekends. You write every day, right? Uh, I paint, I, I draw every day, and I, yeah, I write in my journal every day and yeah. have since 1984. And so then when you showed me those uh, th in your journal where you would just do some little yeah. paintings and things. So little, I start my day every day, uh, usually. Yeah, what is your day like? <laughs> I mean, what is uh, the day well, of a writer or artist? Uh, how, how do you... Uh, I watch the news and sketch, and uh, these books, I, I'm trying to learn, from, I'm trying to teach myself how to draw. Uh -huh. I've never had a drawing class. Uh, 
and I go to artists who drew. There's a Cezanne here. I'm very interested in a, a German artist around the time of the First World War named Kathy Kolwitz, and who's a wonderful draftsman. I'm familiar with yeah. Uh, and so I ape or, or copy them. I like to go to concerts because it's, I can sketch people. People uh -huh. are still in uh -huh. concerts. Huh. Uh, I never thought about that. Yeah, so it's a, it's, it's a habit. Richard, what would you say compels you to write? Gosh, it's something I've wanted to do since, I guess, since I was in high school and uh, got diverted along the way. I was an English major and uh, read a lot of things that English majors read and said, gosh, I aspire to, to do that too. Um, I love language, and I grew up with an uncle in our family who loved language and had me look up words and keep word lists. And so since, actually since high school, I guess, I've, I've wanted to write and, uh, and with the exception of a few years in law school, did. Um, so the, the, uh, you, uh, you do poetry and prose as uh, well. Yeah, I just and finished. So what's the, what, I mean, I think a lot of people don't understand the difference. I mean, people know what a poem is, but they don't understand the difference in how you would approach that or... Mm -hmm. you know. there, there are simple ways to, to describe the differences. And one, you begin with what a poem looks like on the page, and you notice that line length is important in poetry, not important in prose. So that when a page of prose is set up, it doesn't matter where the line ends. What is so important in poetry, I think, is breath uh, and rhythm. So as a consequence, it's more concentrated language. Mm -hmm. uh, and prose, I don't want to use the word looser because it's more, it's deliberate. Poetry is also more sensory. Uh, and that brings us back to the idea of images, that is creating verbal pictures. And the best poems I know use as their vocabulary images, uh, pictures in the mind rather than abstractions. Mm -hmm. uh, abstract language I try as much as possible to avoid in, in poems, though it's the necessary stuff of prose. Mm. Mm. And so it depends really on what the subject is. I just finished the last, I haven't written much poetry, well, just recently, because for the last year and a half or two years, I've been working on uh, a history of this area that began on my doorstep when I learned that one of the owners of this house had had lived on Elkhorn Creek and was the first federal judge in the West. His name was Harry Ennis, and his grandson owned this house. There were Indians who were supposedly, uh, who supposedly captured two of Harry Ennis's slaves in what was described in 1870 as the front yard of this house. This house, of course, had not been built then. 
And the book is mostly prose, but it also has a creative or fictional element to it, too. I introduce each chapter with a kind of uh, narrative written as though it is fiction, written as though it is a scene. And, uh, and so I tried to approach the subject from as many perspectives as I could. Rounding a bend of Elkhorn, I see the first angler, solitary, standing motionless, waist deep in green water, shafts of saffron light falling short of the shade in which he swishes his fly across the stillness, air about him laden with an aqua muzziness in which dust motes seem suspended. Around the next, I see more of their number, a pair in a fishing kayak drawn off in a cove, another in a floppy hat hunkered at the water's edge, on a sloping stone that must have fallen from the cliffs above before the first keel scraped Plymouth Rock. Lost in fisher reveries, the brief reprieve from jobs, the raucous levies of family. They do not seem too anxious for the catch, so much as to feed a patient hunger. Content to place their lives on hold, they pause like the dragonfly lighting on the knuckle of one paddle hand to take in the drooping limbs, the scree of an invisible hawk, the white knot of roots on the sycamore whose falling leaves are riddled to gauze by insects. These things that can never be summed but only relished as a meal more substantial than fish, a stay beyond this creek against the hard symmetries of the world, beyond the incessant drone of traffic and the scrapings of famished souls as they feel themselves replenished, feeding on this feast of silence. <laughs> I know this isn't your process, but you know, I can see like you, you have all these great words and you throw them in and then they just kind of like <laughs> go together. So uh, what, what is your process with poetry? Uh, well, how do you get uh, I, don't, I don't begin to understand the creative process. But sometimes it begins with an image. Sometimes it begins with a narrative, something that happens, something that is witnessed. Uh, witness, the word itself, means, the wit means knowing. And so it's about awareness. It's the state of being aware or attempting to know. And when I speak with my students, I often use the word attention. And if you look at the Latin roots of attention, you see hold. If you're a tenant, for instance, you hold a piece of property. If you are tenacious, you grip on to an idea or a thing. So attention is looking at the world in, in, in fresh ways or attempting to look at the world in fresh ways rather than simply accepting the world by habit and custom, as most of us do. Mm -hmm. so, so I think poems begin with attention, and I wish it, were, it was easy to, to say, I just throw words down on the page. Sometimes a poem may begin that way, but then I find like the making of whiskey, it's, it's a process of distillation when you remove, remove the impurities and run it through the still again, again, and again. And so I guess the average poem I write probably goes through at least 10 revisions. Uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, there are some poems that are, that are really never, never really finished because 
Uh, I haven't found the word or the way to express them. I just went back to it yesterday. I read a, a manuscript that I wrote seven or eight years ago. And uh, they're all sonnets, really rough sonnets, on, on the life of Cassius Marcellus Clay. And about three quarters of the way through that, I said, you know, this stuff isn't working. It's not any uh -huh. good, and, and I think I'm just going to put it to sleep. Uh -huh. uh, maybe perform, and maybe a lot of poets, a lot of artists should do this too. They should perform gentle euthanasias on, uh -huh. on work that's just not ready and may never be ready. Uh, but do you think you'll go back to it? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure I found the right means. It, it, you know, the other component of all of this is, is imagination and finding a new way. I, th I think the way these poems are written, they're narrative poems that are sonnets, actually. And there's a problem with getting information into the poems and yet crafting a poem that is based more than on just language, but images. And language ultimately is image, that our language itself, we've lost this sense of it, but a lot of language carries buried metaphors, which is what etymology is all about. Uh, so I'm not sure what, I'm, I'm at a, a dead end with this right now, but who knows? I don't know whether I'll find a new way to do this or not, but, uh -huh. but I could call this, if I really wanted to be facile, I could say this is done, and I would submit it to somebody, I, I think, who, who, who would probably publish it, but I don't think it's very good. It's not the clumps of multiflora blooms that give it form. Not the spiky leaves extending like outstretched palms or scalloped webbing of bat's wings, but the shards of darkness that frame the rusting flowers, the veins of the leaf, each hatching from its well of shadow against a backdrop of black asterisks rooted beneath the flowers, beneath the leafy tongues of foliage. Shadow not light, illuminates us. So what advice would you give to someone that wants to uh, write? Read. Read. I would say, you know, so many writers, the, the poetic impulse is strong in a lot of teenagers, a lot of high school students, and I was one of them. And we wrote absolutely terrible stuff because we didn't read, mm -hmm. and we didn't, or we didn't read enough. And so, any po person who's serious about writing poetry, anyway, should read. Any person serious about writing fiction should read the best fiction they can find. Right. Um, and not only because it's a way to learn, but because it will give you great pleasure. And writing, I think, becoming proficient at writing comes through writing and writing and, and writing. writing and revising and revising and revising. And most of us are content simply to to use language uh, to order food or get directions to go to the next destination. Mm -hmm. But if you're serious about language and you want it committed into print, you have to be, you have to be attentive to how language works and the way to get there and realize that it doesn't pour out of the mind like, like, uh, like water. It, right. it, 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 it's very slow coming and uh, it doesn't come immediately. And even the best writers, I'm convinced that the writers I most admire do not sit down and fill up books with golden prose off the top of their head. Oh, they come back, they revise, not. they work, they rewrite. 
they go through, as I just went through, extensive editing, you know, by other people who's, who change, often small things, but more often small things, but sometimes they'll, they'll uh, one editor I had on this Elkhorn book, uh, took things and said, um, you're getting things out of order, you repeat things, you, you know, uh, things that I, at the time I hadn't noticed in right. which... There's nothing like a great editor, is there? Great editors are so, so important. What's the value of an editor? What, what does an editor do between the author and getting it to press? The editor is a, a gatekeeper and an usher. And what does the usher do? It, it, the usher helps the writing find its seat in the greater theater. Driving along the ridgetop road, I glimpse in a cornfield of broken stalks and shreds of snow, two deer, a doe and a buck, hardly lifting their heads from the stubble on which they are foraging. They're sleek, bark-colored coats of winter merging with a backdrop of trees as their muzzles follow my passing car until it passes, then dropping their wary gazes and bending their necks again at home in the world as it is, despite its jarring metal, its uncompromising engines, its men who pretend they are foliage of summer trees. I feel a tingling that begins in the wrist and spreads with the joy of them. Uh, years ago, I sort of devised this little, uh, not a definition, but a way to describe what I, what I think a lot of poems attempt to do, which is to explain the mystery and the miracle of our presence on the planet. And so a lot of art is mystery, and a lot of that mystery is a reference to the creative process out of which art, we hope, comes. Hmm. And uh, who can explain? why we're here, what we're doing, what our motivations are. We know we differ from other species mm -hmm. in our, 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 our ability to create images, whether it's in writing or in photographs or paintings. And uh, it's, it answers to the better portion of our our egos, our, our psyches, and, uh, and a lot you, of it's shrouded in mystery. Yeah. Do you think, um, do you think a lot of it is um, expression? In other words, it's, for an artist, it's like, I've, I've got to get this out. I think, a lot, of, yeah, I think a lot of artists feel a compulsion to, I, I think uh, that may be truer of younger artists than older. I think older are maybe more patient and less compulsive, um, maybe because they're more relaxed with the way they regard the world. I don't know. Um, I know that the prospect of making art is one of the things that keeps me going and I'm sure keeps you going and our friends here who are artists in their way mm -hmm. with, with the camera. Uh, and, and maybe at some level it answers to the desire all of us have to in some ways extend our lives beyond our lives. And so we're looking at, we mentioned Cezanne earlier, so we're looking at Cezanne or Degas, and uh, Degas's been dead for over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. and, and yet he's very much alive as we witness his genius right. on a canvas or in a sculpture 
Um, and uh, so in a way, it, it's, it's a kind of pursuit maybe of immortality, but I don't think that way so much. And mm. I enjoy, others would give you the answer that it's the process itself which is important and which is gratifying. It's like uh, most of us get that gratification, say, from mowing the lawn, right? Something, mm -hmm. we're altering nature in a way that is immediately detectable, right? We get mm -hmm. immediate satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I think the artist, uh, once he or she has produced something that said, this is as well as I can do, this is all I can do, there is a sense of completeness. The poet William Butler Yeats described that, that, that sense of completeness. He said, someone asked him, well, how do you know when a poem is done? And he said, a poem is like a finely made box and it's crafted in such a way that when you shut the lid, you hear a little click. A true Kentucky artist, Richard translates his sense of place onto the page and onto the canvas. I don't want to talk about politics or religion. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going. So I uh, blah blah blah. <laughs> I love this. Right, it's yeah. been fun. <laughs> <coughs> blah blah blah. <coughs> <laughs>